We would like to thank Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. Skillshare is an online learning community with more than 30,000 classes in design, business and more. Skillshare is giving away a free two month unlimited access trial to our subscribers who click on the link in the description and after the trial it's only around $10 a month. Today, October 13th, 2019, marks a very special birthday. Ten years ago, Uncharted 2 Among Thieves was first released in North America. It charted the adventures of treasure hunting gunslinger Nathan Drake and his friends, sometimes frenemies, on a quest to find the fabled Chintamani Stone. And I'm here to tell you that Uncharted 2 Among Thieves is going to be fantastic. It's not only fantastic, it's the best action game of all time. I must have played Uncharted 2 more than practically any other video game, rivaled only by perhaps Mass Effect 2, Time Splitters 2, or Dead Space 2. I must really like games that end in 2. I've platinumed it on the PS3 and the PS4, and you know what? If I could do it again, I bloody would, I tell ya! I'm going to be breaking down all its memorable moments, its pulse-pounding gameplay, the heart of the franchise, and why it works so well. Not to mention how much Uncharted 2 personally means to me. Obviously full spoilers ahead, so if you haven't played Uncharted 2 yet, what the hell are you doing with your life? Go out and get a copy now! I didn't play the first Uncharted Drake's Fortune upon release in 2007, but I did end up getting it a year later when I got it bundled with my PS3 on my birthday. It was probably the number one PlayStation exclusive that I was most eager to get my hands on, and when I finally did, Boy, did it deliver. I was blown away by its mixture of gun-totting gameplay, puzzles, and likeable, well-rounded characters. Nathan Drake never stopped feeling like a character, even when the cutscenes ended. This is turning out to be a really lousy day. It felt like it captured the spirit of both Indiana Jones and Tomb Raider without being derivative of either IP. And whilst small in scope, Nate's first adventure still holds up today. It was around the same time I clinched my first platinum trophy that the teaser for Uncharted 2 came out, depicting a weary and battered Drake traversing a snowy tundra. In the almost year-long hype train that followed, I devoured every nugget of information on the game that I could get my hands on. I waited eagerly for gameplay videos videos, behind the scenes featurettes, and the multiplayer beta. The wait was only made less agonising by Rocksteady's Batman Arkham Asylum released roughly a month and a half prior. I'm ashamed to say that after Platinuming Asylum, I traded it in for money to get this game, like some kind of desperate, uncharted, addled drug addict. Hey, it was 2009, I barely had enough pocket money for any games back then, let alone two. From out of the ashes of one masterful game to another, I purchased Uncharted 2 Among Thieves. I squeezed a bit more out of my pocket money mileage to get the steelbook. Look at this beauty. Just two months later this thing survived our house getting burgled. Like literally all my consoles and most of my games were gone and I remember just seeing this thing still there on the shelf untouched. They must have gotten in and grabbed what they could and luckily Uncharted 2 just missed them. The burglars obviously had no idea how f***ing great this game is because if they did, they would have grabbed that first. Uncharted 2 is one of those rare occasions in life where you get really hyped for something and it does the unthinkable. It exceeds expectations. Uncharted 2 Among Thieves was a step up in just about every conceivable way from the first game. It had more set pieces that had 10 times the production value, more locations to explore, more weapons and enemies, and more strategy baked into the gameplay. But it wasn't simply bigger, its heroes were grimier, its villains more sinister, it had a nastier edge to it, while still being full of fun and charm. <laughs> hey, check it out. Marco! Really? Come on! No. Marco. Hello. The game announces all this in its absolutely stellar opening chapter, A Rock and a Hard Place. The player rejoins Nathan's story in the middle of a very, very, very bad spot. Not only is he bleeding out and battered, he's sat in the middle of a train dangling off the edge of a snowy cliff, using what little is left of his strength. Nathan, and by extension the player, must precariously climb upwards, avoiding falling debris and rickety metal threatening to push you to your grave. Oh, and try not to freeze to death. What an opening. You couldn't put Nathan Drake in a worse spot. And indeed, the opening of this game puts our hero in more mortal danger than he ever faced in Drake's fortune. This isn't a lame tutorial mission where the game wants you to learn the controls, although that is subtly put in there too. This is a set piece that puts our lead in a perilous situation and immediately makes the player want to align with him. We like Nathan Drake because he's in danger, reacting with fear and trepidation just as we would. <laughs> 
Even if this was the first time you played an Uncharted game, seeing our hero placed in a position where he has to muster all of his wits and strength is all we need to know to care about him. Just like any good action movie. And that's really why for me, Uncharted 2 is the greatest action video game of all time, because it's the closest to a purebred action movie any video game has ever gotten. The pacing, the structure of it, the way the audiences see its characters tested, it's actually a playable popcorn summer blockbuster. Now I get the term cinematic in gaming can come with a certain stigma, and in some senses can seem even a little disrespectful. Why do companies use cinematic as a term to sell a video game? As if to imply on a scale from good to bad, the ludic qualities of a title are at one end, and the idea of it reaching the medium of film being the absolute best to strive for. The Brick Gaming Show outlines this really well in his God of War 4 rant, where he also illuminates some of his thinking within the industry itself. So when I looked at this script, the first things I said was, like, this is like a, a, a script. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a game script. So why in this case do I think it's a plus to describe Uncharted 2 as cinematic? Why in fact does that make it my favourite action video game? Well, because Uncharted 2 is actually trying to be an interactive summer blockbuster in its DNA. It's less concerned with upgrades, loot and branching dialogue options, though all those things are components of some truly masterful gaming experiences, and more concerned with how fast the adventure is zipping along, where the next huge set piece is coming from and which characters you have to meet next and fall in love with and root for. You know, like any good action movie. But this is no passive experience. Yes, a good deal of cutscenes flesh out the adventure, but the meat of Uncharted 2's ode to action cinema takes place right in the heart of the gameplay. This was truly the first time I played a game that claimed to have cinematic action sequences as a buzz term that actually delivered on that promise. Nowhere is this better distilled than in three key sequences, the train sequence in chapters 13 and 14, locomotion and tunnel vision respectively, the tank sequence in chapter 20, cat and mouse, and the car chase in chapter 21, convoy. After we witness Drake catch up to the speeding train and leap into action just in time, in one of the most epic opening cutscenes to a level ever, the player is treated to a gauntlet of foes as they navigate through the train's numerous and varied carriages. An absolutely epic battle with a helicopter earlier in the game turns out to be the training wheels for one of the game's toughest sections. What's that noise? Nate has to weave in and out of cover to avoid the blistering hail of machine gun fire, whilst also contending with the dangers of traversing the speeding train, not to mention the hordes of soldiers throwing themselves at him. Facing down this relentless helicopter is a challenge that combines almost all of the core tenets of Uncharted gameplay, as you shoot, cover, leap and climb to some semblance of safety. Truly, you never feel safe in your first encounter with the helicopter until the stunning arrival of the tunnel sequence. You then get to fight fire with fire as you turn the tables on the copter and blast it to bits. This level is just peak Uncharted. Not only do you get to live out every action movie fantasy of being on a speeding train, you get to fire RPGs, sniper rifles, shotguns, each in their own tailored sections that interlink in an organic way that keeps getting tougher and tougher. Ah, a minigun totting human tank. And I'm armed with a machine gun. What to do? Ah, oh, I know, I'll shoot the clamps. Nathan Drake dodging the hard work with an easy way out like a true action hero. This chapter is a technical marvel. Naughty Dog actually managed to pull off the mechanics of getting a train to move through an actual environment, passing changing vistas, jungle scapes, tunnels and into colder territory. This worked by essentially tying off both levels on a great big loop for the train to pass through, giving only the illusion that we're heading to a destination by breaking up the two key environments by a tunnel section. And of course, it ends at the exact narrative midpoint of the game, as we see Drake betrayed by his plundering companion Chloe and shot by Harry Flynn, before tumbling into the absolute train wreck that is the game's opening chapter. What a great way to bring it full circle 15 chapters in. Several chapters later, as we enter the third act of the game, Lazarevich's army descends upon an innocent Tibetan village and wreaks havoc. Once again, Nate fights an enemy who vastly overpowers him, and the player is forced to seek cover any which way they can. You go over, under, and precariously alongside the tank as it pursues you like some sort of Terminator with wheels. Imagine that. 
But what also makes this mission work is that, like any good action experience, the groundwork has been laid to make you care. In a preceding chapter entitled Where Am I, Drake wakes up after this awful train ordeal to find himself in the care of Tenzin and his village. But the player then gets to do something that doesn't happen all too often in Uncharted. Everything slows down, there's no danger to speak of, it just gives you a moment to breathe. You can explore this village, kick a ball around with the children, pet the cows, the player will begin to paint up a warm picture of the village and the kind-hearted people who reside there. So when we later see this... Bersas. Bema. It's affecting, and provides even more impetus to beat this foul beastie, with rockets. Lots of rockets. A good action movie will often seamlessly chain together different set pieces in a way that builds the danger and excitement. That is true of Uncharted also, as we're immediately whisked away into a snowy convoy pursuit. This is the sort of level that any other game would have you pinned to a car on rails. You'd shoot a prerequisite number of foes before a button prompt would likely appear and you'd see a scripted sequence play out where your controlled character leaps to the next vehicle. Not here. Oh no, you maintain full control. The player decides when to make the jump from vehicle to vehicle. Hell, you can straight up sit there if you want to, although I wouldn't advise it. Of course, for the chase to work, there must be certain things that have to happen. You have to eventually move to another car if you want to continue, and there's only so many variations of routes the cars could take during the fight. But Uncharted 2 hides this so well that you don't notice. It makes you really feel like you're at the heart of your own action game, leaping from car to car as you cook a bunch of fools. It's glorious. The spectacle delivers, but even the meat and potatoes of the gameplay from the climbing to the shooting is insanely fun and expanded upon from what we saw in the first game. Even in a paint by numbers shootout, Naughty Dog added in a whole new variety of weaponry and enemies that make the shootouts in the first game look tame by comparison. You'll take on heavies with shotguns that flush you out as the more standard cannon fodder attempt to take you out from a distance. And then there's these guys, complete with T-800 style miniguns that make them feel like mini bosses, and they are incredibly satisfying satisfying to take out. There was a real concerted effort to make the battles feel more vertical. In the first game, climbing and puzzling and fighting felt like distinctly separate gameplay endeavours, but in the sequel there's plenty of moments where the developers combined these disciplines. A particular standout moment is this shootout. You're being attacked from all three sides whilst you're boxed in on a massive sign. All you can do is hang and constantly rethink your position to remain safely covered. The closest you can come to picking up collectibles is entirely optional and has no impact on the gameplay. The whole game is never afraid to have fun, you can play as Donut Drake, nor is it afraid to slow down proceedings just to further invest the player in these characters and psyches. The stealth stuff is a little wonky at times, you can't exactly use it to clear out entire rooms, but it was an interesting addition to the series and one that went on to get better and better before being perfected in the fourth instalment. The way it's introduced in the story gives way to an excellent little heist sequence early on in the game. There's a guy above you, there's a guy above you. Didn't they kill that guy? I thought he didn't want to do that. There's a guy below you, there's a guy below you. No matter which difficulty setting you play on, the game strikes a perfect balance between making Drake feel like a badass, but also satisfyingly vulnerable. So when you clear out a room, leap from a crumbling structure, or simply have a train to catch, it feels fantastic to stick the landing. Having said that, crushing difficulty is... well crushing, sometimes rage inducing, but like any abnormally hard difficulty setting on a video game, wanting to hurl your controller at the screen before cooler heads prevail to the finish line is part of the fun, right? In the PS4 remaster, there's even a brutal difficulty, which is even harder than crushing. I mean, I think it is, it's below crushing, does brutal sound worse than crushing? What do these words mean anymore? I think I'd rather be brutalised than crushed. Why am I thinking about this? There's a lovely helping of unlockables too, including fun little tweaks to how the game plays. There's a plethora of skins which basically allow you to play the game again as a different character. If, like me, you wanted a Sully spin-off game, you can kind of pretend here with a Sully skin. You could do the same for Chloe, but then I guess you could just play the Chloe Frazier spin-off game. The multiplayer. Wait, what? The multiplayer server's been shut down? September 5th? Ah! 
Are you kidding me? I missed it by a whisker! This makes me sad, but it was inevitable, I guess. As I was about to say, the multiplayer was a huge addition to the series at the time, but it carried with it much trepidation. This was around the same few years when it felt like every game had a tacked on multiplayer component. Do you remember playing Dead Space 2's multiplayer? No, me neither. I think I played it like once for shits and giggles. But Uncharted's vertical combat mechanics and tomb plundering lent perfectly to playing with friends. Again, the sequel introduced something entirely new which became a mainstay of the series. Today, you wouldn't expect an Uncharted game without it. Even 10 years on, this game is absolutely gorgeous. The first game impressed with its lush jungles and old structures, but Among Thieves just knocks it out of the park, seriously. The art direction is stunning. My particular favourite locations being war-torn Nepal and these icy caves. In chapters 8 and 9, the city's secret and path of light respectively, the puzzles are fun to solve but also provide a spectacle of their own. There's no denying Uncharted 2 is an incredible experience. But lots of games have good cover shooting, good climbing, good puzzling. A game doesn't even need to be fun to look gorgeous and photo real or have a distinctive art style. Uncharted is really good at what it does, but so are a lot of games. What ties all of these elements together to bolster Uncharted 2 as head and shoulders above other contenders for greatest action game of all time? Well, I'd say it's the characters, the story, and Naughty Dog's unique approach to capturing both that made Uncharted a cut above the rest. At the heart of Uncharted is, of course, Nathan Drake. Nathan Drake was a character that came out amidst a trend of having silent protagonists because game developers kept pushing this idea that it helped you become more immersed in the game you're playing. Unlike the baffling decision to remain mute for every single encounter, Nate is a talker, a charming, smack-talking, quip machine. But more importantly than any of that, he's a human being. He gets scared, he's vulnerable, we see him struggle to get up after he's been hurt. He clearly cares about people. When the first game was being marketed pre-release, Uncharted gained the unfortunate nickname Dude Raider, purely because it featured a pulp adventure aesthetic and Tomb Raider had the monopoly on that kind of experience in gaming. But as creative director Amy Hennig points out, the two characters couldn't really be more different. She was this aspirational, acrobatic James Bond character, so we made Owls a little hapless, a little clumsy, more like Harrison Ford in Indiana Jones, right at the limit of his ability a lot of the time, on his heels. And you really do feel that across the entire game. Nate is in his own Jackie Chan action comedy at times, constantly getting into increasingly tough situations, constantly outnumbered and outgunned, but never giving up. Nate just can't seem to catch a break, and that only makes us love him more. The Indiana Jones comparison is obvious, how could it not be? But I actually think he's got less in common with Indy and more in common with Han Solo. He's a bit more violent, a bit more cynical, and he screws up because he makes all the same mistakes over again. Like Han, Nate is forced to choose between helping himself and helping the greater good, when our leads realise the awesome power of the Chintamani Stone and what it would mean if someone as dangerous as bad guy Lazarevich got his hands on it. Now come on, I'm through playing the hero. Your adversary will not give up so easily. He will not stop until he possesses the thing he desires. And truly, Nate would be nothing if not for his travelling companions and fellow adventurers on both sides of the line. Uncharted 2 introduced us to Chloe Frazier and Harry Flynn. The former is an adventure-loving thief who shares a lot in common with Drake, but is also willing to go the extra mile to get what she wants, even if that means screwing someone over. The latter, on the other hand, is a cheeky British chappy, the one that kicks off the adventure by cutting Drake in on the heist. Before promptly betraying him, I'd liken him to someone like Sam Rockwell in Iron Man 2. He's not competent enough to be an all-out villain, but his self-interest and greed means he's often leaving our hero in real nasty spots. Looks like it's the end of the road, mate. No, 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 no. Not yet. I want him to see Shambhala and die knowing that I have taken it from him. Lazarevich is probably still the greatest villain in the series. He's the only one that truly feels like a legitimate presence. This dude's got some mad Bane energy. The final battle where he's running after you like a f Terminator is terrifying, especially on crushing- Gah! He's easily the most frightening villain, if a little one note, but he's the perfect enemy for this story and still manages to test Drake dramatically in ways you wouldn't expect. Like when he forces the treasure hunter to contend with the fact that he's a mass murderer. You think I am a monster? But you're no different from me, Drake. How many men have you killed? How many just today? 
Sully, rather disappointingly, only really turns up for one mission in the game and the final cutscene, making his role in Uncharted 2 more of an extended cameo, which is a shame for one of the best characters in the series. Even so, it's great to hear that goddamn voice. I had to grease a few palms. Did go through the rest of your money, and a good chunk of my own, but hey. Ah. I think there was an expectation with the Uncharted series to make each story self-contained, harkening back to the serialised adventures of the 30s and 40s, and in turn, the Indiana Jones franchise. And sure enough, the opening levels of the game would suggest this. Bar Nathan and a brief appearance from Sully, the game introduces us to all new characters, locales, and MacGuffins, entirely divorced from the first game. And then, Elena Fisher comes in. Elena Fisher. Unlike almost all of the other characters in the series, Elena is not of this world. She's not a treasure hunter, she's a journalist, keen to capture a story. After the events of Uncharted Drake's Fortune, Drake went right back to doing what he knew he was good at, but Elena continued trying to fight the good fight, to live an honest life. Their paths cross in among thieves when the pair find themselves both on the hunt for Lazarevich in Nepal, for drastically different reasons. This guy's a real monster, Nate. And again, I see Han Solo and Nate when I see their relationship. Elena is the layer to Nate's Han. She knows he does questionable things, he's self-serving and a bit of a scoundrel, but he's got a good heart. And when push comes to shove, she knows he'll do the right thing to make sure people don't get in harm's way. Across the adventure, they reconcile their feelings for each other. And it's clear that, unlike Indy, the Uncharted series would be about one overarching collection of relationships over hitting the reset button. I like that they didn't make Nate a woman in every port kind of pulp hero. Instead, his relationship with Elena evolves across each game right up until they tie the knot and settle down. In this game, they kind of play with that trope a little bit, as Nate clearly has some past history with Chloe that's a little more than friendly. Both Chloe and Elena come to represent two different sides of Nate's internal conflict. Chloe is the one to tell Nate he should get out whilst the going is good, think of himself before anyone else, but also to go for it, pursue what you want, go out and get it. Whereas Elena is the one to remind Drake that monsters like Lazarevich exist and it's up to people like them to stop him, whatever the cost. Purely because it's the right thing to do. Of course, Elena's sensibilities win out, as they should. And Drake and Elena even managed to convince Chloe to be a hero too if even a little bit. These characters are only so great because of the performers behind the scenes imbuing so much life into them. From Emily Rose to Richard McGonagall and of course Nolan North, the cast of Uncharted get to put not only their voice and personality into the game, but their physicality as well. The thing that makes Uncharted uh, a lot different from a lot of video games that even when they do mocap is we all prepare the same way we prepare for an episode of a television show or or a feature film shoot. Unlike most other motion capture video games at the time, which recorded dialogue separately, Naughty Dog opted to have everything delivered at once, which lent a real authenticity to the way these characters moved and interacted. One of the advantages of uh, having actors who do both the voice and the physical performance on the stage is that you get this unique energy when the actors interact with each other that you just don't get when you record everybody separately in a sound booth. I'm sure they'll cast some wonderful actors for the movie that's probably coming out in... I don't know, another 10 years, but I know I'm going to find it so hard to accept anyone else other than these guys as my Nate, Sully, and Elena. In fact, Nolan North is so Nathan Drake in my eyes that it pulls me out of literally any other video game when I hear him. Cat, they got pulsar Why the hell is Nathan Drake in an Iron Man suit? All of this came together because of the passion and attention to detail on the part of creative director Amy Hennig and the team behind her, who treated the material with the care it deserves. How the performance fits into the larger story, into the script as a whole, I'm listening for the writing, whether it's working, whether what's on the page is coming out on the stage. Naughty Dog are nothing if not masters of their craft, and it's no small feat that they've never really dropped the ball, giving us incredible action-adventure games with real heart time and time again. You might be wondering why I didn't pick any of the other games in the series over this one. I mean, really, the only crime that Uncharted 3 made was that it wasn't Uncharted 2. A lot of its core ideas and set pieces feel very similar, and whilst it's incredibly fun, it doesn't make the same leaps Among Thieves did, nor is it as well paced. Uncharted 4 is also fantastic, and a fitting end to Nathan, Elena and Sully's story, but I don't think you get as much out of it without being invested in the original three games. Which is fine, that's the kind of point of Uncharted 4. But if I was forced to choose one, gun to the head, no takesy backsies, it would be Uncharted 2 every time. Every. Single. Goddamn time.
Don't get me wrong, Uncharted Drake's Fortune, Drake's Deception, and A Thief's End all have a huge place in my heart, but Uncharted 2 is the quintessential Uncharted game, the instalment that would set the tone, the scale, and the ambitions of the series going forward. And you know, I'm sure everyone has an action game they love. Perhaps more than this game. I mean, you're crazy, but sure. For me, Uncharted 2 is a hallmark of when my relationship to video games was simpler. When I was a kid and I had the time to plow an entire weekend into multiplayer matches, or venture across the cosmos in the Normandy, or tell someone online I've never met that I've had sex with their mum. As I'm sure is the case for a lot of people, finding the time to dive into a video game and lose an entire day to it is easier said than done. Playing Uncharted 2 for this video meant I could excuse devoting hours upon hours to it because it was technically research, but usually finding the hours to devote to the latest title I'm desperate to play takes a little bit of life planning, which sucks. Getting the chance to reconnect with this game and experience the adventure all over again was a joy. And to me, it is really the whole package. It's thrilling, it makes me laugh, it makes me care, and you get to fight souped up monsters with crossbows. What's not to love? I always get a smile on my face thinking about this game and how special it is to me, and it's kind of hard to believe it's now a decade old. So happy birthday, Uncharted 2. You're still the greatest action game of all time. And thank you, Naughty Dog for making an experience I'll never forget. Today's video was made possible by our sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare has more than 30,000 classes to choose from and we've loved exploring the rich range of courses they have to offer. Of course, one of the key things needed to make any video essay is editing, which is why Nikki Stevens' course, Creative Video Storytelling and Editing, Making the Most of Stock Footage, is the perfect way to enhance your editing skills. Whilst the course is primarily about stock footage, we found it really pertinent to our own work because when we're making video essays, we're likewise using the footage to emphasize a particular point or create a specific emotion. Stevens has some really illuminating stuff to say about using footage in montage to enhance a point you're trying to make. Her message that shots exist as a means to literally show what you're saying really illuminates the difference between a good video and a great one. If this sounds up your street then premium membership gives you unlimited access so you can join the classes and communities that are right for you. Use our link in the description for two free months of unlimited access to fuel your curiosity, creativity and of course your career. So we didn't think we'd be doing this, but um, someone has actually donated one hundred dollars, which is incredible. Yeah. Thank um, you very much, Dr. Chike. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, honestly, that's awesome. You are, as we said in our Patreon video, literally keeping the lights on. So um, no, but seriously, thank you very much. And um, yeah, yeah, we're just sort of in shock, yeah. aren't we? <laughs> Full Fat Videos is going to strange new places. Full Fat Videos just got upgraded. And along with that, we're upgrading our Patreon with new tiers and rewards just for you. Patreon could really, really help us make Full Fat Videos self-sustaining and it'll allow us to make better videos and better content for you. For just $1 a month, you'd be helping us out a great deal already, which is why we thank you at the end of every video. Not to mention you'd get exclusive access to Full Fat Milk Posting, a Facebook group where you can talk to us about movies, TV and games, as well as some memes. We like a bit of memes. For $3, you'll get access to everything from the previous tiers, but you'll also get the chance to watch our videos one day early, as well as get access to exclusive scripts and bloopers. For just $5 a month, you'll get access to everything from all the other tiers, as well as exclusive access to ask the questions for our monthly Q&As. And that's not all. For just $10, you'll get access to all of the above, as well as an exclusive commentary track picked by you. For $100, I mean, you'd, you'd be keeping the lights on, so we'd really appreciate it, and we'd probably thank you at the end of every video on camera. You'd be really helping us in any way, shape or form if you could consider contributing to our Patreon. We love making this stuff for you guys and we'd love to keep making more of it. So thank you and thank you for watching. We're off to go make some more of that juicy content. We'll see you next time. Stay milky.